Thomas Lewis will amaze you with information that proves why everything you've been taught about cholesterol is completely wrong. Also, I don't want you to miss a dramatic story about how a man under the care of statin therapy and how the use of those drugs nearly ended his life. Plus, as you'll soon see, the effectiveness of statin drugs has been over-exaggerated for years. And you'll discover how the pharmaceutical industry uses those statistics that they have and marketing to fool the public. Enjoy this presentation with Dr. Thomas Lewis. Okay, so this is going to be probably one of the more important areas of discussion when it comes to heart disease, Dr. Lewis, because everybody's hearing about cholesterol. I think most people are very scared about it. Let's break this down, talk a little bit about cholesterol. Well, I think we have to realize is that people are worried about bringing cholesterol in through food, but that's a minor source of cholesterol in your body. The liver synthesizes cholesterol, and I've yet to find something that the liver synthesizes, the brain tells the liver to synthesize, that's deliberately harmful to our body. Here's factoid number two. Your brain is only 2.5% the mass of your body, small part of your body. 25% of the cholesterol in your body is in your brain. So if cholesterol is so harmful, why is it in our brain? And then the third piece of this puzzle is that the brain, second to the eye, which is very small, brain is much larger, is the most vascular tissue in your entire body. So if, if cholesterol is causing heart disease, which is really vessel disease, why is our brain with all that cholesterol up there not deteriorating from vascular pathology from the moment we're born? And I think it's important to point out that I think a lot of this is born out of this simple, overly simplistic concept that cardiology sees plaque inside of us. Cholesterol is a part of that. Oh, cholesterol must be the problem. Well, it was, it was expedient. And it's like turning the Titanic. They went down a certain path with Ansel Keys and it was hard to write that path. And Dr. McCulley, one of my mentors at Harvard, was actually besmirched and thrown out of Harvard in 1969 because he refused to accept the cholesterol theory of cardiovascular disease. He was the one to show that elevated homocysteine is a much stronger predictor of future heart disease compared to cholesterol. And cholesterol does elevate. It's like, um, are there fire trucks in a fire? And the answer is, the answer is yes. So just to give a, a more broader perspective, Jonathan, about the prevalence of cholesterol in the animal kingdom. I always try to quiz my participants to get them thinking provocatively and create an oh my god moment. So. If you had to pick the food highest in cholesterol, it, it's nothing compared to what your liver produces, but the food highest in cholesterol would be organ meat, and in particular, the brain of other animals. So humans are not selective towards cholesterol as a vital nutrient. It's, it's highly important. So there's an article published by the, um, the outreach component of Harvard Medical School, the Harvard Medical Letter. They say trusted advice from Harvard Medical School. And in 2007, they published an article called Cholesterol, the Mind and the Brain. And it said despite its notoriety in heart disease, they didn't say despite its cause in heart disease, despite its notoriety, cholesterol is an extremely important substance. It's a building block to the steroid hormones, cortisol, the sex hormones, testosterone. So if you're low T and you're on a statin drug, you might now know why. Estrogen. It is a building block of cell membranes. And this Harvard article said very specifically that not only is cholesterol there to create structure, but it's actually there to create function in all cell membranes by allowing materials, nutrients, ions, whatever, to flow in and out of the cells. 
and our cells are batteries, so you need that flow. So when you when you inhibit the production of cholesterol or the transmission of cholesterol through your body, which we'll get into, then you're impacting the health of your cells. So it's a very insidious thing. So the interesting thing is I've used this article from Harvard to help people that were just frightened by their doctor that says, oh, you have to be on this cholesterol-lowering drug or you're going to die, to explain to them that even Harvard has a different view. About three months ago, I had an eerie feeling. This was published in 2007, so 13 years ago. But for some reason, divinely or whatever, I had this feeling that because this because statins and cholesterol treatment is so important to the medical community and Harvard sort of the leader, that it might someday go down. So about three months ago, I saved a copy as a PDF file. And then I was doing a consult with a very intelligent microbiologist who was on statin drug and had all kinds of joint pain. And I said, let's just Google the brain cholesterol Harvard and you'll see this article. And it wasn't there. But I saved it and sent it to him. And then I wrote to Harvard, the, the head, a chaired professor at Harvard Medical School who was head of outreach, and I just asked him in impolite ways why this article was no longer relevant, why they took it down. But of course, uh, statin drugs are the most ubiquitous drugs in history and have made um, $100, hundred billion dollars in profit, so it's hard to fight that that engine, but you know, they don't really have a, they don't really have a good track record, but the thing is when you look at cholesterol, LabCorp says 100 to 199 is normal, some labs say 0 to 199, but in the low end of cholesterol, much higher risk, and the number one condition that leads to early mortality when your cholesterol is low is violent deaths. You can look it up. It's right there, violent deaths, suicides, related to mood disorders. When your cholesterol is low, your brain that has 25% of the cholesterol is suffering, is suffering, and your mood goes down. So in my world, 160 is getting on the edge of too low. I'll give you an example. We had a participant in our program who had a family history of cardiovascular disease. So he was on a cholesterol-lowering drug. And my wife, who does all the forensic work for our team, got his records going back 10 years and showed cholesterol below 160, cholesterol 140, cholesterol 150, 130. And so eight years into cholesterol therapy, statin therapy, he has a massive heart attack and he almost dies. Now, we got his record right after the heart attack and his white blood cell count, which not important, I guess, but it's much more important in predicting heart disease, it was 14,900, a very high number. So what we did in this case is we titrated back to find out why did he have the heart attack? He's on the preventative, protective medication. And so here, let me just do it briefly. Low cholesterol for a long period of time. Publications at the University of San Francisco University of California, San Francisco, and Kaiser Permanente, major studies show that when your cholesterol is lowered too far or it's too low, you're much more prone to infection. So now let's look at this gentleman, plant manager, not a bum, you know, uh, a well-to-do guy, intelligent guy, has a massive heart attack at the age of 57, he joined our program six months later. So it turned out that three weeks prior to the massive heart attack, he had his tire uppers removed for dentures. And that created, it's like hitting a hornet's nest. Let all the hornets fly. And so it's well published that even up to a year after a major dental procedure, but particularly in the first 30 days, high risk of a vascular event, high risk of a vascular event. So why does a 57-year-old uh, plant manager lose all his uppers? Because his cholesterol had been lowered so long that he became vulnerable to infection, periodontal infection, as per Kaiser Permanente, not some fringe group, one of the largest healthcare systems in the nation. So 
ultimately, you know what caused his heart attack? Statin drug. The, the medication designed to prevent his heart attack caused his heart attack. I just want to crystallize this for people because I've heard this concept over the years on and off by very few people. But I think it's really important what you're bringing up. The idea that you're physically driving down cholesterol because of a drug is a very dangerous thing on a practical level for a lot of people who have a lot of these infections. Without the cholesterol lowering medication, a lot of times I've heard that cholesterol, and I'd like you to speak to it, is very protective and can actually be elevated. Like too high a cholesterol might be a sign that someone has infections or toxins or something is going on here that people should be much more aware of than just thinking, drive your high cholesterol number down into the basement because of a drug, not address all the toxins or the infections. And that's where real injury can happen in the body, right? Well, let's look at what cholesterol does according to that Harvard Health article. And I'll, I'll give that to you if you want to make it available to your people. But it is a membrane builder and cells are constantly breaking down and then being rebuilt. So red blood cells last about uh, four months and we completely replace them every four months. So cholesterol is part of that process. So if your cholesterol is high, it's very clear that you need it to rebuild cell membranes or new cells. So you obviously have something causing them to deteriorate. But I think it's important for a nomenclature perspective. The drug lowers LDL. LDL is not cholesterol. LDL is a lipoprotein. What is a lipoprotein in the body? What's the analogy to the real world? It's soap. That's what an LDL is. It's a soap. Why do you need soap in your body? Well, because we have fats, like oil in, in your salad dressing, and we have water. Your bloodstream is water. So how do we carry fats through a water-based bloodstream? So very simple. If you have a greasy dish and you wash it with just water, does the grease come off? But you put detergent on and now it comes right off. And all you've done is you've encapsulated the grease into something that is soluble in water. The exact same thing is happening in your body. LDL is being produced in the liver along with cholesterol and the LDL simply carries the cholesterol through your bloodstream to tissues that need it. But the thing is it's not just carrying cholesterol, it's carrying vitamin A, that's soluble, EPA, good for the brain, DHA, other important fats, vitamin E, fat soluble, vitamin D, fat soluble, Vitamin K, fat soluble. So any number, it's basically LDL is a taxi cab. And you know, the industry has made LDL bad cholesterol. It's an absurd thing, first of all, it's not cholesterol. Second of all, it's not bad. It is a transport mechanism for things that are essential to our body. Now cholesterol is not an essential nutrient. And I probably shouldn't have said that because our, our body synthesizes. An essential nutrient is things we have to get from the outside you know, like vitamin A from food, we're not synthesizing vitamin A, but we are synthesizing cholesterol. So what is HDL? HDL is simply the cousin to LDL, it's not good or bad, it transports excess fats or oxidized fats back to the liver for recycling, reprocessing, or disposal. So LDL carries two, HDL carries back. So what is HDL really telling us, you know, the good cholesterol? It's really telling us that if it's depressed, you have insufficient healthy fats and healthy vitamins because you don't need the HDL to carry them back because there's not, a, there's not an excess. There's not a, a, a surplus circulating in your system. And when LDL is up, it's simply saying that your body has a need for these essential and synthesized, you know, controlled by the brain, things like cholesterol, like vitamin A, like vitamin D.
it, vitamin D is not getting around your body without, uh, without LDL. Oil and water doesn't mix. And again, all that Western medicine is teaching people is be alarmed over a number and never once did they talk about lifestyle changes that could certainly, easily, quickly change these numbers if they really had to. They don't know. Most people don't know. Yeah, well, a good number for cholesterol based on international studies, and that's total cholesterol. Once again, it's a misnomer. Whenever we're talking about free cholesterol, so we're talking about HDL plus LDL plus the free cholesterol to get a total cholesterol number. But it's around 220, give or take, based on how, how high your LDL or HDL, importantly, is. And do you need an HDL of 100? Probably not. You know, 50, 60, that means you have sufficient healthy fats circulating, you have enough recirculation, if you will. But, you know, so that's, that's the right range. And what I've shown in, in our work, looking at things like fibrinogen, which is a signaling molecule for repair and recovery, is that fibrinogen tends to go up, clearly when you have need for more repair and recovery, because fibrinogen will go up when you cut yourself, and you obviously have to heal, fibrinogen signals that process to bring all the appropriate repair molecules to the problem. But if your vessels are inflamed, fibrinogen will go up. And we see a very clear correlation between elevated fibrinogen and elevated total cholesterol. That means elevated LDL and elevated cholesterol being carried by the LDL to guess what? Repair. Fibrinogen is probably telling the liver to produce more LDL. And it's all regulated by the brain. And once again, I can't reiterate enough, 25% of the cholesterol is in your brain. And that means it's 10 times more concentrated here than any place else. Yet, you know, my brain still seems to be functioning despite all that cholesterol up there. Right. So let's talk about what most people are being exposed to now because of all this manic craziness about cholesterol, and that's the statin drugs. Talk a little bit about what you've seen in your research, the real data when it comes to taking statin drugs. Right, so, uh, you know, I wrote in my, my book on Alzheimer's that, you know, you, the, the statins play, you know, the cholesterol plays a very important role in, in brain health. But I also did a lot of research on the drugs that lower cholesterol before statins and the ones that lower cholesterol after statins. And you don't hear about them. Why if, if this new uh, PCSK, I think the inhibitors, are so fantastic at lowering LDL, why aren't they the rage? And why are statins still prescribed? Because these new drugs only lower LDL, which is a very bad thing. A statin does three things. Number one, it lowers the production of LDL in your liver. Number two, it lowers the production of CoQ10, which is a very important coenzyme in metabolic function and muscle function, so that's why you have a lot of pain and, and congestive heart failure coming downstream from statin use. But the real reason why statins provide any benefit at all is they're actually antibiotics. They come from macrolides. So there was you know, creating a drug is a business decision. You know, obviously there's great science going on in the pharmaceutical industry and all that, and some of the things they discover are amazing. But what actually comes to the market is always a, a business decision. That's incredible what you just said at the end, though, about how it's an antibiotic as well. So many people are running around with bacterial infections. Right. So, okay, maybe it has some benefit, but wouldn't it be so much better to take away the toxicity of a statin drug right. and take care of the infection naturally. Right, so, so um, you know, they, they may have to make a decision. Do we mar how do we market this thing? And marketing is a cholesterol lowering without telling you that it's antibiotic because no one's going to take an antibiotic for life. And most people that are on statin drugs are on them for life. So what I did is, um, in, in this book here, Jonathan, Quarterback Your Own Health, I have all the data on the surprising antimicrobial aspects of statin drugs, the surprising anti-infective activity, and there's lots and lots of publications showing this, but I had a, a more direct 
path to the pharmaceutical industry. So a, a gentleman, a medicinal scientist and friend of mine, Steve Schmidt, when I was up in Cambridge, Mass, was on the Warner Lambert team that developed Lipitor. And then Pfizer bought, bought Warner Lambert and Lipitor became the most profitable drug in history. And my mentor at Harvard, Dr. Trump, informed me that statins were antibiotic because he studied the molecule and he said, these are macrolides. And like biaxin and zithromycin, these are all um, antibiotics. So it's in that family. And so one day I just went to uh, Dr. Schmidt. I said, Steve, statins are antibiotics. What's your comment? He goes, we know that. So the pharmaceutical industry knows, and that's stupid, they know why they provide a little bit of benefit, but there's something very confusing in medicine, and, and there's a little cliche, there are, there are lies, damn lies, and there are statistics. And the statistics on statins are very weak because they give you relative, relativistic statistics on how they work. So, for example, let's say we have two people and one benefits. That's 50%. Now, let's say we have 10 people and two were sick and one benefit. So they report it as 50%, but it's really only 10%. So I, 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 myself and Dr. Trump at Harvard, we studied the Zocor trial, which is a major, major statin clinical trial with published data, 51,000 patient years of study. And they present the relative statistics from those that received benefit that those that didn't and they came up with a number of like 22% benefit. But they weren't used, they were using it like out of 10, we went from two to one, okay? The real efficacy in terms of preventing uh, cardiovascular disease with a statin drug is 0.3%. That's the absolute value. That's the so-called numbers, numbers to treat. That's the real important number in terms of will it work for you or not, 0.3%. But the problem with it is so many, there's so many downsides to these drugs that like you mentioned, Jonathan, let's find a better way to treat the infection or the inflammation. You know, just doing something which I'm, I'm such a, a, a zealot about, cod liver oil. And you know, I, I know some people will bes besmirch cod liver oil, but cod liver oil has written documentation of clinical benefit going back to the Viking era, 1,000 years. So there's no supplement on the market that has a longer history of improving human health than, than cod liver oil. And what does, it, what does it do? It brings cholesterol to our body. But it brings vitamin D. It brings all the fat-soluble things. But if you're on a statin drug, you have now suppressed the efficacy of these healthy foods because you know, you're, you're stuck in this vortex of depending on glucose. You can't, when you lose weight, this is published in Livestrong and Mayo Clinic. Guess what physiological marker goes up to indicate you're losing weight? And Jonathan, it's a rig question, so I'll just answer it. LDL. Why would LDL go up when you lose weight? Because you're going from stored fatty acids to triglycerides. And the triglycerides are transported to be burnt to LDL. So when you start losing weight, you go into a little more ketosis, burning fats. The only way you lose weight is to burn fat. And the only way to burn the fat is to get the fat to the tissue that will burn the fat. And LDL is the transport vehicle to do the same. So if you're suppressing LDL, guess what? You won't lose weight. Right, but this is so, it's common sense what you're talking about. All the toxicity of all these medications. The, the toxins are causing the body difficulty in functioning well. So many of these drugs suppress bodily functions. It just makes perfect sense that it's harder and harder for people to live a healthier life if they're loaded down with these drugs. Yeah, there's no, there's no question about it. There's no, there's no free lunch, and unfortunately, we live in a, in a world of instantaneous gratification. But the statin drugs and the cholesterol lowering is the only thing that the medical community, is, the traditional medical community is doing to manage chronic disease and they're, they're literally failing. The Wall Street Journal about four months ago came out with an article and it was titled uh, Heart Disease Death Rates in America 
are going up, even in healthy places. And they looked at three cities in Colorado, but overall they showed that, like Louisville, Kentucky, and a couple cities in um, Colorado, with the death rate from cardiovascular disease from 2011 to 2016 went up by over 20%. And these are in people where 48% of the people in the study were medicated with statins. And since from 2011 to 2016, the overall death rate on a per capita 100,000 person basis in America, despite the blood pressure medications and the cholesterol lowering medications, gone up by 4.3%. So how can anybody think that this is solving a cure or any even kind of solution? You know, the, the CEO and chairman of Kaiser Permanente dies in a sleep from a heart attack. John Warner, the president of the American Heart Association, three years ago at a heart association convention, has a massive heart attack. And of course, the fake news shows, oh, President Warner, resting comfortably, comfortably had a minor heart attack. But then they interviewed the EMT that serviced Dr. Warner that saved his life and said his heart stopped for like six minutes. So I guess we have a new definition of a minor heart attack. If, if your heart stops for six minutes, it's now minor according to the American Heart Association. But you can be sure these people are on statin drugs. Obviously. That's, that's the only thing they know to do for chronic disease. Okay, so let's get into a little bit the uh, last few minutes as we're closing out here, Dr. Lewis. Some of the things we can do if someone does have, and talk a little bit about what you consider a very high level of cholesterol, but more importantly, what can people do to kind of bring it down to a more safer level, which you said is around 220 or so? You know, it, I hate to say it's the usual suspects. It's the usual suspects of healthy fats, um, marine products, which are very anti-inflammatory, high nutrient density foods. So, you know, my, my plate, not the my plate, is about 75% vegetables and, and healthy fats. You know, my favorite, my favorite um, plate is smoked salmon and a Greek salad. You have fermented, you have um, a rainbow of, of vegetables and you have a little bit of, of healthy protein and fat to support your brain. You've got to support your brain. If you're not supporting your brain with nutrition, you've got a big problem. But People who have chronic, I'm not talking about genetic familial hypercholesteremia. I'm talking about someone with a cholesterol 280, 320, 340 chronically. And that used to be the old standard before they wanted to really suppress it with the drugs. Is um, they probably, and this is well published by the University of San Francisco, probably have an inflammatory or infectious process. So looking at, stop looking at the cholesterol and look at what's really underlying it. It's the white blood cell counts, it's the C-reactive protein, it's the fibrinogen, it's the sedimentation rate. And then let's run a very detailed risk survey on you to see what myriad of things that can be contributing to the elevation of um, you know, your immune response and susceptibility to infection. Again, Mike, just to make it really clear and simple as we close out here, Dr. Lewis. The idea that the toxic fats, you said healthy fats, toxic fats that have so much crap in it that we don't want to eat and put into our body, sure. all the chemicals and the fruits and the vegetables of non-organic food, all of these things, the infections that we don't deal with in our body, this is what's causing the body to say, red alert, create more cholesterol, patch up areas, especially when it comes to the exactly. cardiovascular system. Mm -hmm. Let's try to put some plaster in there. Let's try to keep things together so that we literally don't explode. I know I'm being dramatic, but is this pretty close to a picture that people should be thinking of more? This is it. And we, we really got to think of the mentality of a chronic disease as being on a continuum. You know, when you, when you get the flu, it's a sudden surge. But chronic disease slowly matriculates. And if your cholesterol is slowly going up, that means you have some underlying pathology going on that your body is trying to correct and repair. And, and cholesterol is extraordinarily part of that repair process. So we have to look at it for what it really is. And, and our brain doesn't, doesn't fool us or doesn't trick us. It's producing cholesterol for a very important reason. Thank you so much, Dr. Lewis. I know this is going to help a lot of people out. Appreciate the time.